wanted to talk today about disagreements, why we disagree. When I say we, I'm talking about the Christians in the Christian world. There's certain tendencies I think all humans share and they will be more pronounced in certain groups or certain communities. Just like obviously in the Christian community, there's tendencies for judgmentalism and cloistering, getting locked into certain communities of thought and not wanting to have any differing thought enter into your little fiefdom, your little realm, your little community, such as it is. And as someone, my wife and I, some too, who have gone from thinking one way to another, we are very aware of this, acutely aware of this, and we can see how people will, or we're learning now, looking back, I should say, we're, we're seeing how people do this and we're starting to understand why and it helps to be specific so I'll be specific we were in religion we were very devout if you want to say sincere we believed in what we were doing and ostensibly religion is about getting to know God hopefully in reality it's not in reality it's a form of bondage and structure and business and when we came to find out that that it was more about that than it was about finding God we started asking questions of our God going directly to him to find out what is this all about for lack of a better term who are you is this what you want us doing does this line up are the things we are seem to be seeing in scripture that contradict what we're doing or what we're seeing before us are we seeing this right what's going on Lord show us and so we went from religion to relationship which is not a just boom it happens it's a process it takes time yet at the time you make that decision there is a huge difference even though you're still in the process of learning how to do that you have completely, it's a paradigm shift to use that cliche. You completely change the way you look at life because life is no longer trying to serve and or please God. Life is now trying to get to know God. And then once you realize you can get to know him and he's just there and available and he loves and accepts you perfectly, even before you get that in your heart, you get that in your mind and it's just amazing. And you think, oh my goodness, everything I've been doing, it's, it's empty. It's not what it's all about, so to speak. But not everyone gets that simultaneously. There is no hundredth monkey to coin another one where, where all of a sudden everyone knows it, or maybe there will be in the future, but right now, it's just here and there, people here and there are getting freed from religion. It's not big waves. So when we got our freedom and we saw how beautiful this was and how awesome this is and the truth and the freedom and the peace and the joy and the understanding, things are starting to make sense in, in the sense of directly from our God whether we attended the building or not, we didn't have to wait to go there or do a study or something to find out. And, and we still love reading the Bible, study the Bible all the time, but it would happen without even reading the Bible sometimes because God is a spirit. And he said that he will lead us into all truth. So sure enough, he was giving us these incredible moments of understanding and peace and revelation. And, and it was all him. So when we came to this knowledge, and it was still in the, in the beginning stages, we kind of felt like, wow, we didn't, maybe didn't realize at that moment we were beginning to go out the door, literally of the building we attended, but we knew something big was changing. So 
we are still in the kind of let's figure this out thing. So my wife sent out some uh, text blasts on a couple questions, at least two. One was what is repentance? And the other was what is the gospel? Because we just, we realized once we started learning what these things really were, we thought, well, or at least I thought, I can't speak for my wife totally on everything, but I thought maybe, maybe they all know. Maybe they know what the gospel is. And I was just the only one that didn't know what it was. Maybe they all know what repentance is. And they take it for granted, so they don't really talk about it because, hey, that's just Christianity 101. So anyway, we wanted to find out what people thought or what people believed. So she sends out these blasts to dozens of people on these two questions. Like I say, at least there might have been a third one, but mainly those two questions. And we got back the reality that they didn't know what repentance is. They didn't know what the gospel is. They're saying things like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they just didn't know. And in in that blast of those dozens of people was included our leader. And like I say, I'm talking about how we relate to each other, how we disagree with each other, and how we come to know things. And when when we do realize we disagree with each other, how do we deal with that? So if you look at it from the context of here's two steadfast, stalwart, whatever you want to call it, pillars of the community, of the building, of the apparatus, of the organization, of the business, all of a sudden are asking questions like this. I try to put myself in that position now looking back and think, wow, what would I think if I was in that position? because it was never followed up with, okay, let's have a study or anything like that. We just asked it just to try to find out where people are at. Are they where we were before we understood and we found out they were basically where we at, were at before we came to this understanding, the truth of reality. It wasn't news. The gospel is what it's always been. Repentance is what it's always been, but no one knew it. No one knew it. No one in the building knew it. Like the leadership did to a certain extent in an intellectual sense, but the point I'm making is, is that it was clear that here's two people who are really starting to question things, say, wow, what is this all about? I'm, I'm rethinking this. And the response was crickets. There was absolutely nothing. So we've s somehow looking back and in the short term, we thought, wow, that was crazy. One one day we're there, dedicated for years and years and years, day after day, in the place, and then we're just gone. And it's almost like you can get the feeling like, wow, that just kinda, there must have been a mistake. Somebody tripped, uh, something was lost in communication. But when you, you take it in the context of a leader knows, if you can imagine yourself being in that position, here's, here's these pillars and all of a sudden they're asking these questions there's an understanding that something is going on this is not just everyday stuff this is not just bible study sunday school stuff this is something huge and it, there was a choice to deal with it in a certain way because to not deal with something is to deal with it it is to to not respond is one of the most powerful forms of communication there is in the world that's crushing they say nothing and and what we were saying was god loves us because it went on to other things more direct myself representing both of us i went to the leader hey we're realizing god is just not who we thought he was he loves us perfectly he reconciled us himself we're safe in his arms we don't have to worry anymore about losing it about being in trouble with him and on and on and on. God loves us. Crickets. Crickets. Just nothing, which was powerful. It was so powerful. And it was later communicated to us that, well, saw what was going on and just kind of wished it would go away. And as my little personal inside joke is, it did. <laughs> as in they did, as in we. And 
But it, I look at it all as a blessing because we didn't belong there. It could have been done in a, in a nicer way. So like commu communication was still left open and relationships were still there. That would have been great. That was my whole desire the whole time. But you can't control what other people do. And when people value their structure of the business more than they do people, they find that threatening. So to boil it down and the communication and the difference, like I say, specifically to Christians, that it, it, it relates similar in, in all people, especially when you're dealing with truth. But this is the ultimate truth, the absolute ultimate truth. What we found out was that our God is a God who is not of religion and has no religious requirements. He's just a God who loves us. The Lord Jesus Christ loves us. He loves us all the time. And we have communication with him all the time. We don't have to put on a special uniform. We don't have to be in a special denomination. We don't have to sign off on the special statement of faith or doctrine of this or that or the other. We don't have to attend the special building. We don't even have to listen to the special guy. He's just there and he loves us. And even if we're smoking cigarettes and drinking and carousing and doing all kinds of things, we can just turn to him and there he is. There he is. I know the first thing people will say is, oh, wow, there he goes. Now he's just living a life of sin. I'm just saying that to make a point. We, we have no desire to live a life of sin. We're not doing any of those things. I say that to make the point that we were became confronted with the reality of our God and so therefore his spirit came into us and so confronting us was the same as confronting him and that's what made us so unappealing because when your religion when your tradition when you doing what you need to do to be right to get right to stay right is no longer necessary that's a huge threat that's a monumental threat because now since that was the purpose and existence of the life of the religious people and specifically a leader facing someone who didn't need that who knew that their God loved them and didn't need any type of affirmation or confirmation from any source anywhere other than just one on one me and my God my wife and her God. That's all we needed. That was terrifying. It was truly terrifying. They could not look at that. And us just being there forced them to realize that we don't have that. We, we, got, we got a connecting point, which is this building, this religion, this denomination, this various and sundry activities we do that keeps us fellowship with him. But if you, you come to someone and say, oh, I have fellowship with him all the time, whether I do those things or not, not that we were saying don't do those things, we're just saying we don't need those things. That was threatening. And that is how it was intuitively, if not consciously, because I don't know what level this was understood. Although I take that statement that says, I knew what was going on. I just wished it would go away. I pretty much take that as an active or conscious decision. Maybe not interpreted the way I'm interpreting it right now, but that is the reality of it is God came and he was speaking and that was too much. That's why, and I'm not, we're not comparing ourselves to Jesus or Paul or any of this, but when you got the light, you got the light. What can I say? The Lord lives here and we don't fear anything and we'll talk to anyone. It's just that when when you don't have that, there is fear. There's tremendous fear. And facing your God, facing the notion of just, here he is, here's God. My child, it's me, your father. I love you. Do you believe me? That's it. That's everything. When it's that simple, the religious person has to run. They have to hide or they have to stay there, stand there and face him and look at him and make a decision and say, yes, I believe you or no, or yes, but can I still do these religious things? 
or whatever. But it, the point is, is it makes a huge, a huge confrontation with their God and with themselves, which is what most people don't want. And I understand that. Believe me, I understand that. I was an atheist for 46 years or 40 some odd years. I was in religion for 10 years. So this is not in any way a judgment. It's a call to you if you're religious or if you even know me or if you don't. But just if you're putting your trust in these doctrines, in these traditions, in these denominations, and these people that can all look at each other, you can all look at each other when you're not sure about something and just say something and go, amen, amen. And that's where you get your validation is all the amens coming back at you. And, you know, I don't know how popular this is in the Christian community in general, but where I come from, amens were demanded. There was never any question about anything from the pulpit being accurate or not. It was just, you guys got to amen more because the Spirit won't help me preach unless you amen. And we, we would be mocked all the time. There'd just be this screaming and hollering and jumping and running around in this ridiculous way, and we'd just be sitting there like like a bunch of just a, <laughs> just nothing. We're just sitting there daydreaming or whatever we were doing. And then it'd be said, you know, something like, well, that's the best I got. If you ain't going to amen that, I don't know what to do. I, I can't get no better. And all of a sudden, everyone would start shouting and amening on cue, on demand. And we just came to realize we wanted something more. We wanted an actual relationship. And it's just that simple. We wanted it, and he gave it. There's, like, there's, there's numerous accounts. Blind Bartimaeus, the thief on the cross, all kinds of people. When their heart turned toward God, they got God. But guess what? Now you got to accept him. I'm not saying you can't go back into religion. I, I believe it. I turned towards my God many years ago, and then I turned towards religion. And so I, I missed out, at least on the fullness of that. I still had moments. I'm not saying if you're in religion, you never have moments. I'm just saying the fullness of it, the day by day, the moment by moment, the walking with him. As Adam walked with his father, you can walk with your father every moment of every day just by putting trust in him. You wind up in a building you don't. It doesn't really matter. That's not the point. The point is you prioritize that. All you want is your relationship with him. And wherever you are will be the right place. Just know that. Recognize that. If something has happened to you, if you're in a building and you're thinking about leaving or you've experienced some of the similar things my wife and I have experienced, just know this isn't random things. This isn't accidental. These are executed and designed and choreographed. And on what level of consciousness, I don't know. Sometimes people do this in an instinctive way because they're trained this way or intuitively through their fear and through their religiosity and their judgmentalism or whatever, sometimes they're very caring people. I believe that we were loved tremendously. And to this day, we are being prayed for. You know, if not constantly, very regularly, we are being prayed for. The problem is, is that the, the, the real thing didn't happen that needed to happen. And that was that what happened to us was something that they would even consider. Because they didn't even consider it. They didn't listen. We just instantly got labeled and whether you are told that or not and you, like I said I'm talking to the person that's, that understands what I'm saying through your own experience is you've you've likely already been labeled a certain thing you're easy believism you're a liberal you're once saved always saved you're which I believe in but the way they do it the way they label it they put labels on things so they can deride them it's just like you know I believe God is one so now I'm, I'm over here, and, and the person I'm pointing, you know, oneness, oneness, and they declare these things as a heresy, and, and just so they can write you off without having to discuss it, without having to look at it, listen to it, consider it, and really hear you. They just put it out there. Oh, that's a heresy. You're under this label of heresy. I don't need to consider anything that comes out of your mouth. I'll just go pray for you. And that's not how it works. Not in reality, God. God isn't there micromanaging everything. We are here to make decisions. And like I say, that in itself is a decision. It's the decision to deny reality. And people do it every day. They're, they're still doing it, I guess. Like I say, I'm not saying they don't love us. They love us. We love them. And fellowship was broken because something that was the most important thing in the world, the thing, 
our relationship with our God had just exploded into reality. It exploded our religion and formed our reality as the most important thing. And that was made clear. Even if we are heretical and we're totally off out of our gourds, you know, or in fact, all the more if we're uh, out of our gourds, out of reality and, and lost and backslidden, as they say, it would be all the more reason to communicate with us. And, and if you have the truth, why not then go face and talk to that person and, and try to steer them right? But no, it was ignored. And that's why that says so much to me. It doesn't automatically prove that we were right, but I know because I have intimate information and I, I know we're right. And I know, you know, you don't know about us, but you say if you if you living through a situation like this, you can be sure that the fear, that the shunning, that the refusal to talk to you isn't by accident. It isn't by accident. They structure it that way. Here's the holy thing. Do the holy thing. What? You're not doing the holy thing? You're unholy. So therefore, they don't have to even discuss anything with you. Why would you discuss something with an unholy dog that's just doing their own thing or under the influence of Satan or whatever? So be encouraged. Know that you and your God alone is fine. And if it lasts that way for a long time, that's fine. He'll find you a place where you belong. You might go through a long time on your own. Certainly Paul did. Paul didn't have thousands of people around him. He, You can tell that by his letters. He named them by name. So it was a relatively small circle of people. And when he was in prison, he never got any visits from John, Peter, James, the pillars. At least not that we know. There's no record of it. I would think there would be a record of it if such a thing happened. But he had his own crew, so to speak. People that believed in the grace of God. And if you believe in the grace of God, be be thankful. Be happy. Have, be of good courage, as he said. And don't worry about it if the pillars so-called call you a heretic or just refuse to talk to you because that can be hurtful. I understand that to me, it was just curious and over time I've figured it out. I can see it for what it is. It's, it's based in fear. It's based in superstition. It's based in a need to have your structure, your organization, your business running the way it's supposed to run. And any threat to that it's just that. It's a threat. We can't have something that deviates from the business plan. And don't be in the business plan. You're not an organization. You're in an organism. You're in the body of Christ. Trust that. Be happy for that. And be strong. And be of good courage. And he will find a place for you. He will. Just know that you right now, you're already where you belong. When you trust in your God. When you know that he loves you. And you don't have to prove anything to him. Because he loves you because of what he did for you. Not because of what you have done or supposedly will do for him. There's nothing you can do for him except believe him. That's what pleases him. That's why it says, for, for without faith it is not possible to please him. He that cometh to God must, must believe that he is. So believe that he is. Believe that he's everything. And be free. Be free even in... The condemnation, even in the shunning, even in the name calling or the ignoring or whatever it manifests in. You know, not, I'm not saying to be proud, but just be strong and be of good courage because you're with your father in Jesus name. Amen.